Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, uh, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the uh, US Department of Energy. This series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. Mosni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, and to be the host for today's webinar, Software Design Patterns in Research Software with Examples from OpenFOAM. The webinar will be presented by Tomislav Marek. Tomislav studied mechanical engineering at the University of Zagreb in Croatia and obtained his PhD at the Institute for Mathematical Modeling and Analysis at TU Darmstadt in Germany. He's currently working at TU Darmstadt as an Athene young investigator uh, he develops and structured Lagrangian, Lagrangian Eulerian interface approximation methods for simulating two phase flows in geometrically complex domains using the open form open source software. Almost a year ago, Tomislav presented a webinar in this series, uh, a workflow for increasing the quality of scientific software. And today's webinar has been motivated by some of the questions and comments from, from the participants in that webinar. We have issued more than 200 tickets for today's webinars. We never, we never know how many people actually are gonna show up at the end, but all attendees have been muted. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc, I'll put the addresses soon in the chat. Uh, and uh, we have asked Thomas Lav to add breaks during his presentation so, so he can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, with that, Thomas Lav, stop my sharing. So I will start my sharing. Um, yeah, so uh, I will discuss the software design patterns in research software, and I'm going to be taking examples from OpenFOAM. That's uh, the software I've been using to develop numerical methods for two-phase flows, which is uh, what you see also in this in this title slide. Uh, one verification example of, of these of these methods. Uh, but first, uh, a disclaimer. So. Um, I'm working with OpenFOAM. I'm a scientist working with it. I'm not a, a, a developer. Hey, um, hey uh, Tom, is left just yeah. a second. It seems your the volume is very low. Oh, okay. One second. Thank you. Is it better? Uh, I think so. It's good for me. Let's see the, the participants here. Okay, so yeah, I think you... people people are happy. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's try again. Um, okay. So um, yeah, as I was mentioning, so I was I'm I'm a scientist working with with OpenFOAM. I'm not uh, a part of the OpenCFD Limited that actually holds the trademark on the software. It is open source. It's GPL. You can use it, uh, work with it under no public license um, uh, restrictions and freedoms. Uh, but it's trademarked, so I, I have to I have to disclaim this. Um, so let's basically start. So um, um, research software um, that I'm working with uh, is used for, or let's say we are developing uh, direct numerical simulation methods for multi-phase flows. And I don't, we probably have a mixed audience, so I just want to introduce this shortly. Uh, what we have are fluid phases that do not mix uh, with each other. They are separated by sharp interfaces, uh, 3D surfaces, like you see on the, on the image uh, to the left. And these phases exchange mass, momentum, and energy at these fluid interfaces. Uh, the surfaces can deform, break up, and, and merge. And the DNS uh, methods, the direct numerical simulation methods, they try to resolve all um, scales, so length scales and, and, and spatial scales, while ensuring convergence, volume conservation, and parallel computational efficiency. So it sounds um, uh, interesting, probably to, to some, and, and doable, but it's quite challenging. And um, uh, part of this challenge is also to de develop a proper research software in, in a very modular way. And why do we do this? Well, because uh, multi-phase flows are practically everywhere. So just to list a couple of technical applications, we have fuel cells, lab on chip uh, components, shape of hydrodynamics, coating, 3D printing, you name it. I mean, it's uh, multi-phase flows are basically present in many, many technical and um, uh, natu natural uh, processes. So um, to look at one of, one of these uh, methods, 
uh, called the unstructured level set run tracking methods uh, shortly. Uh, we have uh, this methods working, doing amazing things uh, on, on, on structured meshes, which means that your solution domain is divided usually into some kind of cubical sub subdivision. Um, um, and uh, what we are trying to do is port this method to unstructured meshes. And the method itself combines different things. So we have different algorithms that need to be somehow combined. And you see this on this schematic image. So we, we are computing sign distances uh, from uh, our fluid interface. So this uh, interface is approximated in this case uh, as a triangular surface, which is denoted as a bubble here. So there's a communication between the bubble and the sign distance field that's stored somehow in the background space. Uh, we uh, need to ensure that um, uh, this, this uh, sign distance calculation is regular or good enough for approximating curvature. Um, uh, we have to reconstruct this uh, three-dimensional surface uh, to handle topological changes. So if you have these two bubbles hitting each other, they may uh, coalesce, they, they may merge. Uh, so this needs to be handled. And if uh, the points, so these, these triangular points are moving through space, uh, we need to somehow uh, search for them, right? Because uh, looking at the picture to the left, left we see um, uh, in this cut below that uh, some some polyhedrons are going to contain uh, a subset of, of the interface. And then, of course, to move this uh, surface, we need to interpolate velocity. So um, probably other researchers or other researchers surely have different kinds of, of algorithms that they use for, for their research software. And uh, most likely they have to uh, combine uh, some of these uh, algorithms in order to make the method uh, work. And uh, how does this um, then develop into, into, into some research software? Um, well, by applying some uh, layered approach to software, right? So this is something that uh, one starts with at the, at, the, at the beginning to categorize things, separate them into different categories um, uh, in order to keep uh, the code understandable and, and, and clean. And this, of course, is uh, developed together with uh, my colleagues, uh, to, to, Tobias Tolle and Jun Liu. Um, and what you see here is the schematic diag diagram of one of these methods that we are working on. Um, and in these, in these yellow um, rectangles, uh, you see these different uh, algorithms that somehow have to be put together and, and combined in order to make things um, yeah, work. Um, these methods are kind of, I would say, uh, quite special. Why? Because they use a lot of geometry, they use a lot of kinematics uh, to approximate fluid interfaces. Uh, and the only way to determine the, their quality is by verific verification and validation studies. So uh, there are other methods where one can do much more uh, rigorous mathematics um, and uh, prove things. But I would even say, even for, th for those methods, it's one thing to prove something that, that something works, and another thing is to have a, a code or research software without bugs that actually um, does it. And as Ozzy mentioned, so there was another uh, Ideas ECP webinar that actually covers the workflow for increasing the research software quality in this, in this context. But the main point here is not this, it's, it's that when we have these kinds of sub-algorithms, sub we don't have um, one algorithm per category, right? We do not usually have a surface tension model um, that just works immediately. So we go to the board, we write out, uh, write up a surface tension model, we implement it, debug it, and so uh, perfect, we have a scientific publication, we solved a problem that's 30 years old. This, this is not how it works. Um, usually a surface tension model um, is just like an abstract concept, right? Um, and we, our job as, as researchers is then to find a concrete model that actually improves on existing models from the literature. So uh, what happens is uh, these uh, yellow rectangles are actually, they become roots in a, in, in a hierarchy, right? So uh, the, the surface tension model branches out into different kinds of um, uh, sub-elements of the hierarchy or sub-models that should be inter interchangeable, right? So these models need to be combined in, in, uh, in a specific way in order to make things uh, work. Um, not only that they have to be interchangeable, they need to be interchangeable easily at runtime, which is my own, so to say, personal claim <laughs> from, from my experience in working with these, with these methods. Uh, and that's without changing existing code. Um, and why is that? Yeah, if you look at the first point, if the quality of the method is determined by validation and verification, right? Uh, we do not want to modify our source code every time that we want to create a new combination of something, or every time that we want to add a model, we have to mod modify the client code. 
this is bad in whatever language um, or whatever context you're, you're researching. Uh, because it's, it slows it slows us down. That's that's the main problem. Um, at some point, things will work, but it's much much slower than than um, allowing for a runtime uh, uh, interchangeable uh, models. Okay, so um, before we talk about this uh, uh, and how to, how to how these hierarchies grow and, and how how we can combine their elements, uh, we need to understand something about the elements themselves. So uh, the idea. Uh, of, of, of object-oriented programming uh, comes to mind uh, as, as a tool uh, for uh, creating abstractions. So what, what we do, we, we take complex things uh, like the communication between uh, this the bubble and the mesh that you have seen, or the front, we call it the front in the front tracking context. Um, and we take this complex thing and we abstract it um, uh, in, in C++ in this case uh, as user-defined type, well, something called a class. Just giving this background information for for those that that need it. It's, as I said, it's a mixed audience. So um, what what we do not want uh, to do is, if you look at the the code snippet to the left, uh, we you see this large amount of data, right? Um, uh, triangle to cell, uh, uh, dynamic lists, uh, cell to triangles to vertices, all these kinds of uh, maps and, and, and indices. So what we do not want to do is to have this somewhere in the global scope of our software and then uh, spread out uh, pieces of code that manipulate this global information, because this makes it super complicated uh, to follow the program structure. Um, uh, especially because in research software, uh, you start out with a small code and you usually end up with a large code. And I, I would even say that nowadays, uh, if you want to solve something uh, substantial, it's unlikely that you're going to do this by uh, starting to write your own research code from scratch. It's more likely that you're going to be reusing legacy research codes, in research groups and, and, and uh, research labs. Uh, that's because that's the point of programming, right? To not reinvent the wheel. So um, in order not to do this, in order not to have this data and functionality spread out everywhere, uh, we encapsulate this. So we, encapsulation just means putting things together. So we take the data and we take the behavior that's changing the data, um, meaning the, the functions that, that change their, their, their data, and we put them together into this abstraction, um, a class or user-defined type. And uh, the C++ language has access specifiers uh, that make, makes, make things either accessible from outside or inaccessible, and we prefer to have things inaccessible um, uh, because then we have a, a narrow, uh, narrow focus. Uh, so we, we know that only the, the, the member functions that, that are belonging to this abstraction can change the data. Um, so what we put to imagine you're some programming, we put the functions, we put the data together, and now we have these concepts, right? Or, or, or we have we have the abstractions. And, and on this line, these the abstractions are named quite simply A, B, and C, right? So they do something, whatever they do, they do. Um, um, the next step is then to understand the um, relationship between these, these elements. So how can they, um, uh, let's say, work with each other? So what, what, are, what are the possible relationships? Um, there are two relationships that are very important, uh, inheritance or deriving, uh, where we have a class um, a B inheriting from, from class A. That's a wrong <laughs> uh, sentence on the slide, you have to correct this. So you have class B here below inheriting from, from A. Uh, this inheritance works as the same in the same way as it does um, in biology, where species inherit some some properties uh, from previous species. Um, another mechanism is uh, composition. All right. So uh, what we can have, we can we can do is we can say, okay, um, A inherited some proper uh, B inherited some properties from A, but it also has C. So it, it uh, composes. Um, uh, 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 objects of, of, of the class C. And this relationship is marked with this black uh, diamond. And the one next to B uh, means that one object B uh, composes, and then you have this star, uh, many objects of, of type C. And you can see this uh, in, the, in the diagram where you just, I just said, okay, I have a standard vector uh, um, of, of, of C being stored in B. And, and these are the two basic mechanisms um, and the language to express them with these uh, rectangles and arrows and all this is called the unified modeling language. And if, if you haven't heard about it, it's something that, uh, let's say one of the takeaway messages from this webinar is to, to look at it <laughs> and to learn it because it, it really um, uh, it, um, uh, simplifies things a lot. So once we have defined uh, the inheritance and the, and the composition, we look at an engine uh, or a mechanism uh, speci uh, specific to the, to the C++ programming language 
called dynamic polymorphism. So what what sounds complicated is basically it's it's not it's a bit technical, but uh, once you once you uh, let's say accept it, <laughs> it becomes second nature. So um, what what we can do we can address the object of the derived class using the pointer to the base class. Okay, and um, how does it look like? Um, this is a code snippet uh, that kind of demonstrates uh, how OpenFone does it, and I guess how, how other source code also does it. So we defined some uh, configuration data in some file, right? Um, we read this configuration data, and then we can use it to create um, a new object, right? That's a pointer to A, right? Here, A is our base class. But when we use the uh, behave member function, right, to, to A pointer, um, and we have chosen B as input, then uh, A pointer is going to actually behave like B, right? So uh, why is this even relevant? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually quite, quite powerful. So um, uh, when we write uh, our solvers, uh, when we write uh, applications that actually do things, I don't know, process some information in whatever kind of way to keep it keep things abstract. We are going to write the code that you see here on this slide. And this dynamic polymorph polymorphism makes it possible for us to add uh, a B, uh, in this case, EFG, whatever, um, uh, into this hierarchy below A and never ever change the client code. And this is very important. So we don't change the actual code in the application and we keep adding functionality. And that's that's uh, that's the key um, um, key aspect of this. Okay, so we now know. Okay, we, we encapsulate things to to program abstractions to pro program things on high level, and these abstractions can uh, somehow cooperate with each other. There, there are some engines and mechanisms that allow this. Uh, so what's what's the deal with these software patterns? So why are they useful? Um, uh, they support programming on a very high level of abstraction. Uh, so um, uh, we we know we do not want to think in, in terms of uh, low level de details because if we can really get bogged down by low level details details and not see the, the bigger bigger picture of, of, of all these algorithms that have to be combined somehow. Uh, and this is how, where software design patterns help. They modularize uh, the functionality, so the thing that the abstraction actually does is modularized, and then uh, they also um, uh, modularize their their interaction. So if you look at code snippets on the right hand side, uh, we have we are speaking kind of like our writing in, in the language of, of let's say in this case computational fluid dynamics. So we have some kind of mesh that that's needs an update, right? Mesh.update. We have a moving reference frame object that needs an update. Um, we are making some some volumetric fluxes relative, moving parcels or, or particles through space, um, evolving surface fil films and writing down things that need to be written down. So um, uh, the high level of abstraction makes this code readable. If I were to, uh, let's say, replace this mesh.update with the whole code that's actually required to refine an unstructured mesh, uh, it would not be so clear that a mesh update is underway, OK? Um, um, so um, uh, these design patterns, uh, they, they, they basically define the way these abstractions interact and work with each other. So in, if you consider like what, what do par parcels of these par particles actually require from the mesh in order to evolve accurately? Uh, or which objects uh, are actually going to be written down with this runtime.write? This is what, what these design patterns are for. Um, so um, they, they, they were not made up by, by someone uh, with, um, using a piece of paper. Um, they were actually code structures, so source code structures that emerged uh, in, in time, right? Uh, and they have combined inheritance and composition, um, uh, and they emerged as best practice solutions for, for these specific design problems. So different uh, software uh, engineers uh, had uh, encountered different, uh, uh, encountered the same design problems, probably like in different maybe companies or institutions. And um, through the years of using object-oriented programming, um, uh, these, these patterns basically emerged as best practice solutions. And I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples uh, from uh, OpenFOAM. Um, actually, OpenFOAM is quite huge, um, but uh, it it's, uh, kind of owes its size to these software design patterns. They are literally like Legos. So um, if you understand these, um, I think one, two, three, four that are listed that we are actually going to take a look at in this webinar, uh, you can understand the way OpenFOAM is built. 
And uh, it's a source code uh, that has hundreds of thousands of, of lines of code. Um, so what we are not going to cover are, are, are these two, like facet and curious uh, CRTP. We are going to look at um, uh, the main ones. So this is going to be the template method that's used in boundary conditions, viscosity models, and the discretization schemes, then strategy. It's a super important one. Um, uh, we used in tra also tra transport models, um, uh, solvers and preconditioners, and many other examples. And observer that's uh, really, really widely used um, uh, software design pattern um, that uh, I'm going to we are going to look at uh, here dynamic mesh handling and input output synchronization. And another, uh, like the final one, but I think probably the most important one um, is uh, open forms uh, creational pattern or just creational patterns in general. So creational patterns are um, patterns that um, are responsible for solving the question, how do I create objects, right? Um, and OpenFOAM has its own called runtime type selection and it's used for everything. But I put it at the end, you, you will see why. Okay, so it, let's look at the template method. So I, I mentioned before that we have this dynamic uh, polymorphism and dynamic polymorphism is based on, on virtual member functions. Um, uh, so you have these functions that change the data inside the class and you can specify some of them to be virtual. What does this mean? Um, this basically means that uh, we can implement different behavior in a derived class. So we have here a phase indicator that's kind of an algorithm that's going to give us information about which fluid phase occup occupies some point in space at some, point, at some time t. And we derive from, from phase indicator two types, so smooth, heavy side, and geometric, and we kind of implement the uh, calculate phase indicator uh, member function, making each of those uh, behave differently from each other. So um, you find this uh, in open home boundary conditions where you have these uh, virtual member functions uh, called update coefficients uh, and uh, evaluate as, as examples here. Um, you find this also in uh, viscosity models, just for example, again, uh, some virtual member function that's responsible for computing the uh, uh, kinematic viscosity. And um, that's basically it. So it's a super simple pa pattern. Um, uh, you just basically focus on the virtual member function. Method is just another way for, for, for a member function. Um, um, uh, and, and you focus on, on, on this or finding the actual like virtual member function that needs to be overridden. And it has, for those of you that, that know some C++, it has nothing to do with C++ templates. It's just a kind of a weird, weird name. So the template method. Um, so the best practice here would be uh, focus and find and mutual, uh, utilize virtual member functions. And this goes for all object oriented code. So if you open a VTK library, um, uh, for, for, for uh, visualization. You will also find object-oriented hierarchies there. You will find patterns there. And if you want to extend the functionality of the library, um, uh, you focus on finding the virtual member functions. Those are the, 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 those are the keys uh, to, to, to this um, modularity. Okay, then. Is, is this a good time for, there are a couple of questions. Is this a good time? Yeah, if you have it, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, we can just ask away. Oh. Yeah, before we, uh, so, so uh, the first question, in slide nine, isn't the full bar style without passing any objects into the functions, uh, encouraging using global variables? Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what, what I'm going to answer uh, below. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very valid question. So, of that, course, well, yeah, yeah, but uh, we, we, we have like 10 slides on that. Later. Okay, so next, next question then. I have read that there is a move, a move to uh, more composition than inheritance. What's your preference? Uh, keep things as simple as possible. I mean, it's it's so I mean, it's so difficult to answer. I mean, uh, it depends on the the code that you're working with, uh, and it depends on the problem that you're working with. And um, if I learned, if I would say one thing is to keep things as simple as possible and to use the the, the lower possible amount of uh, the language functionality that you can. So don't use everything that you find just because it's there. Uh, simplify things as, as much as possible. Yeah. Okay, so please then continue. Okay. Um, okay, so we were at strategy. So um, strategy is basically repeating this template uh, or template method uh, a couple of times. So if, if, if you look at this, uh, the, this uh, UML diagram, so we have now uh, two hierarchies. Uh, one is for redistancing and another one is for the phase indication. And we just take those two hierarchies and we plug them in 
to, to the level set method using composition, where we say a level set method is going to compose one redistancing algorithm and one phase indicator. Um, so what does this actually do? Uh, what, what, if, if we do this, uh, it becomes literally like trivial uh, to perform uh, combinations of some sub algorithms. So uh, we can uh, take a semi Lagrangian with geometric, smooth heavy side with no redistancing, and, and just combine things easily. And uh, if the creational pattern of your uh, research software allows this, which is uh, the case in open form, or if you can, of course, supply your own, um, uh, uh, these combinations, they can be done at, at runtime. So you, you basically program your uh, uh, solver application or simulation application or research software application using this level set method uh, in the, in the uh, uh, client code. And this thing is using the library, right? Uh, where uh, the hierarchy is implemented, and you can switch and change uh, uh, what is uh, combined, which algorithm is combined which, with, with, with another uh, kind of um, algorithm. Uh, this is extremely um, um, uh, powerful. Uh, and uh, we are using it, uh, as you see this like best practice, uh, if we are unsure about sub-algorithm combinations, um, uh, or if we are unsure, I mean, I'm not sure if this geometric uh, model that I'm implementing for the phase indicator is even going to work. It's research, I don't know. So that's one, one kind of uncertainty. Um, so I would say use this always, uh, uh, because if, if you're in research, you're 99% I mean, of the time, I'm personally unsure about uh, what was going to happen. Okay, um, another example of using strategy uh, is the linear equation system solution. So um, uh, this is an example directly from open phone, not, not the things that we are doing, um, uh, where uh, an LDU matrix, which is the uh, um, matrix form that the open form is, is, is using. Um, um, is uh, selecting, we are discretizing an equation ending up in a linear um, uh, uh, system, and this linear system uh, actually is able to Select uh, different solvers at one time, and uh, with itself associated another hierarchy of preconditioners. And if you if you look at the, the source code, you see okay, well each solver is going to then select a strategy for preconditioning. So to every every time that you you have some some kind of doubts or you want to combine things, and you say okay, maybe I, I will use here a couple of algorithms, you can apply the strategy. Okay, so um, if we are going to go to observer, I don't know if there are any questions uh, to answer now. No, we are good. Okay, um, um, and let's now look at this uh, observer pattern. That's, that's the hope that this is going to answer the questions uh, about these hidden, uh, the hidden global axis and everything. Okay, so uh, the observer defines uh, one to many dependency between objects so that when one, one object changes its state, uh, it forwards this change to all the depending objects. Uh, so you have two, two uh, things you have a subject that has a state. And this state uh, is going to be changed uh, or updated when it is modified, and the update is forwarded then to, to the observers. And the observers, they implement the update interface. In this case, it's just don't take these code snippets also for granted. It's just um, a pseudocode here. Of course, I can pass some kind of argument to the update if I want. Um, um, but in any case, I have to then implement this update interface accordingly in the observer. Uh, and I have to register the observer to the to the subject in order to 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 uh, do this for loop. So why <laughs> why do this? So in in in, in the CFD in computational fluid dynamics, you can have um, a particle flow or 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 uh, some kind of um, or you can maybe even use like particles to enhance accuracy uh, at some at some uh, regions of high gradients. There really a lot of methods where, where this is useful. So, um, but let's, let's look at an example of some particles that are tracked along uh, Lagrangian trajectories. And the, this is done on an Eulerian background mesh. So you have a bunch of mathematical points moving through space. Now, uh, when, you, when we initialize this, uh, we will basically tell uh, each particle uh, in this Lagrangian cloud um, in which cell um, the particle is located. Uh, however, uh, this background Valerian mesh that you see, so the square mesh, right? Um, uh, this can uh, change its state. Uh, if it happens, uh, uh, we will make the, the, the Lagrangian particle cloud an observer of the Valerian mesh that's going to be the subject. Of course, we can do this in the other way around, right? Uh, where we say um, that the Lagrangian particle cloud changes the uh, state, let's say, let's say it moves or something. 
Um, and um, in this case, we want to update the information on the side of the Eulerian mesh. If you do this, then you have something called like six-way coupling, if I'm not wrong, not an expert for Lagrangian flows, uh, where mass, momentum, and, and energy is exchanged from the cloud to the Eulerian mesh and from the Eulerian mesh uh, onto the cloud. So um, what happens? We refine a cell, right? So we, we so these these points that were in the center uh, in the uh, in the cell in the center, they knew which the, the, the cell that they belong to. But now we split the cell. If we split the cell, um, we are going to have first more cells. Second, um, the IDs, the labels of those cells are going to change, right? Because uh, we generated new ones. So what happens when when the Eulerian mesh um, is refined? It is going to update its observers. And now we come to come to this question of arguments, right? So the way this is updated um, depends on the implementation. So if if I uh, well, if the subject uh, generates data that's necessary for the update, which is uh, in this case so, right? So the, the Lyrian mesh is split uh, in this case uh, to four cells in the middle. Um, um, a cell map is going to be generated that maps all uh, uh, old cells to new cells. And then this cell, cell map can be forwarded to the observers. Now, if the Lagrangian cloud is an observer, we can have, we will have more observers, right? It can be one of them. Um, uh, the cloud is going to then uh, calculate this um, uh, update of the cell label. Don't try to compile this, it's pseudocode. <laughs> they just wrote to, to bring this point, uh, so to say, to understanding. Um, uh, uh, so but what, what, what the cloud does is loops over particles, uh, uses the cell map that was passed as an argument of the update um, and uh, tries to find uh, uh, the cell label inside the cell map. If the old cell label is not there, this means that the old uh, cell is still the old cell. The cell wasn't split. If it was found, then it basically uh, updates, the new, uh, updates the particle with the new cell ID. So this is uh, a literal kind of example from, from, from CFD of, of this observer subject relationship. Um, this is how it looks like in UML. Um, um, so we have a subject, the subject stores a list of observers, um, it changes states, uh, it can add remove observers, and it can update, right? So update, again, take it with a, I don't know, grain of salt, whatever you want to call it. You can, of course, define an update that, that passes, our, uh, passes arguments. Okay, uh, another example of this is um, uh, where we want to write things down. So we have a, a simulation code uh, that's supposed to write things at some point. And it's supposed to write uh, a set of things using the same output frequency. So if you if we look at the, the Grime on the diagram on the left, left hand side, we let's, let's go quickly through it. So we initialize the, the, the runtime, which is going to be an abstraction for the simulation time. We go into some kind of simulation loop. Um, mesh can move or be refined or derefined. We solve some coupled partially differential equations, and maybe the data is written. Yeah, depends. If, if we have reached the state of the data being written down, then we write the data. In which case, the runtime objects is going to forward the write uh, for all objects that are writable, right? So um, as you see, this in this case, the runtime is the subject, the, the writable objects are going to be the observers. And um, this is good, why? Because we are going to have on the, on the client side, runtime.write written down once in the solver application and never changed again. Okay, and um, uh, inside the, the time class, it's, a pro, it's kind of a, a user defined type of the runtime object. Um, we are going to have a loop that goes over these registered objects and it, it executes the right object member function. Um, and this is much better, right, than having to change our solver application every time that we enhance our numerical method and add some new stuff. Because every time that we add some new stuff, and we usually want it to be written down to visualize the bugs, because the bugs is the first thing that we're going to encounter. So um, we do not want to have this if statement that checks if it's time the time for writing has arrived, and then type, you know, alpha write, surface mesh write, cloud write, whatever we actually added to the solar application. And if you think about chemically reacting flows, where you basically write a sim simulation application that can read. Uh, in right uh, fields uh, in a for loop because you will have chemical reactions happening between I don't know 10, 15, 20 species and the number of species and their uh, um, thermophysical properties change from one simulation to the next. So we, you do not want to write a new solver for the new simulation uh, where you're doing some new chemistry if, if you don't have to. 
you don't want to do that. So if you have a, a numerics that's dealing with chemistry already, you're going to write up a solver application that initializes all the species at the simulation start and performs these reactions. And um, if you have 10, 15 species, you don't want to have if runtime.runtime species run right, species two right, or, 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 four, or four loop over them. And, and writing this every time um, that something changes. Okay, so um, in open form, um, the um, observer subject um, is implemented uh, like this. So you have something called an object registry, again, storing some, some cache table, a map basically of, of, of these registered objects. Uh, they can be checked in, checked out. So the wording is a bit different, right? Um, uh, than, than what you would read online or in the, in the Gag of Four book, but it does the same thing. Um, um, yeah, and, and this is basically what I mentioned. So the time controls the simulation time, and once the time is uh, come for, for writing everything, uh, uh, everything is written down. Okay, um, another example of the observer and uh, global, uh, global um, uh, data manipulation. So actually, uh, the CFD solver is a procedural application. So um, uh, we have some kind of, we initialize the, the, the runtime, we initialize the mesh, we initialize the fields, and then we have a while loop somewhere. So until the simulation time is, is not done, uh, uh, run the simulation. So it's, it's a kind of procedure, right? Um, uh, and this touches the question. So the, 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 the fields that we have, pressure, velocity, density, temperature, they are all global variables. And those variables are modified by, uh, in this case, uh, finite volume method differential operators and solution algorithms for these equations. On the left-hand side, you see the momentum equation and, and the pressure equation. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, from, the, from the piezo uh, algorithm. Um, uh, so uh, yes, I mean, of course, uh, we may have situations where we are going to, uh, 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 let's say, abuse <laughs> um, uh, some design patterns. Um, but um, uh, if, if, it, um, if it keeps things simple and, and running and uh, doesn't cause a lot of danger, it's okay, at least in my personal um, uh, opinion. So there's no need to force a CFD, a computational fluid dynamics uh, simulation application into an object-oriented structure. If it has, if something has a procedural structure, it's okay. If something has a hierarchical structure, then it's good to use object orientation. So yeah, different kinds of um, uh, structures require different kinds of solutions. And in, uh, in this case, uh, uh, is, is where we are kind of like abusing this, this uh, pattern um, um, in, uh, is for custom post-processing, right? So what we can do, um, uh, we can uh, use something called open form function objects. These are not C++ function objects. It's just a naming again. It's a bit uh, strange. Um, these function objects are user-defined types of classes that en uh, enable us to do uh, live post-processing as the simulation runs. So let's look at how this works. So um, the, the uh, runtime is initialized. In this case, this uh, runtime is going to call read for all function objects. Then we go into some kind of simulation loop where uh, the, the runtime.loop is going to increment the, the simulation time and check if, if the time is end time, so to say, if, if, if the simulation should end. And, 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 and it will also forward the call to execute and end to, to all function objects. Then we go through the, the actual CFD um, solution inside the, the, the time loop. And at the point when the point comes to write the data, the runtime is also going to call write for all function objects. So, so you see runtime in this case is again the subject, it changes state. Uh, we have time step increment reached output or end time. And these function objects are the observers. And this is the, the, the kind of the, the point of the question from before. Yes, they access other observers, right? Um, um, and work on them and do work on them. They are again using uh, um, uh, the uh, um, observer pattern to do this. And I would even say it's okay if they are using a constant X. <laughs> if, they are, if they are casting away uh, things and manipulating the fields that were supposed to uh, be uh, manipulated by these uh, PDE uh, systems, uh, uh, equation systems, that would be kind of breaking the, breaking the pattern. But um, uh, usually these function objects are used, um, uh, so to say, to post-process data, visualize things, sample uh, uh, something at, at some point in the simulation and so on. Um, uh, so what we can do uh, with them, we can change solver behavior um, uh, without ever modifying solver application source code. And hopefully we are changing it just with read-only access to these global objects, the fields that I mentioned from before. 
And the, again, uh, the, the UML uh, looks exactly like it uh, uh, did before for, for the observer with a bit of a different notation. Again, a list of things. Yeah, we have a subject with a list of things, a list of function objects um, that composes many function objects. And uh, we have in the subject the read or run um, or loop, all right? Uh, and these member functions are going to forward the calls uh, to the appropriate, appropriate member functions of function object. So yeah, we can, yeah, of course, inherit from function object and then uh, plug this into the solver structure. So we have um, basically what I, what I mentioned before, we have different things that we can do. Um, uh, we can do computer graphics, we can do um, uh, Lagrangian calculations, thermophysical, uh, we have some utilities, uh, field sampling, calculating forces, whatever. I mean, there's many, many things that can be done and you, you can easily program your own. Um, okay, um, what I mentioned before again is uh, uh, this, this, fun, this every function object reuses the observer pattern. So inside the function object, we can hand, uh, get a constant access to the mesh and constant, constant uh, this, this mesh is actually also an object registry. So mesh is a subject, if you remember from before. So um, the mesh is a subject that has a Lagrangian cloud registered to itself um, uh, as an as a observer. And uh, so we can fetch the cloud from the mesh and count all the points in the cloud, if you want, and store this number, right? Um, okay, so um, uh, this is uh, uh, something that's really powerful because it saves research time and it saves HPC resources. Um, how? So if, if we are doing live post-processing, uh, we uh, on a large scale of simulation, uh, we can calculate macroscopic uh, information and stop the simulation as soon as the results are bad. So we don't have to wait for the simulation to finish and then post process, which actually saves also the time in research uh, if you're doing parameter variations or with large simulations, and it also saves HPC resources if, you, if, if this is done. Okay, um, yet another example. So observer is obviously important. <laughs> it's used throughout um, uh, open palm. So we have geometric fields. Um, they are called geometric because they map to um, um, the mesh, to the discretization of the space. Um, uh, in which case we have internal values that can map uh, to cell centers, face centers, or circle corner points, and boundary values respectively mapping again to face centers, um, um, uh, face centers, and corner points. Um, and uh, this kind of unstructured uh, uh, finite volume method relies uh, on an unstructured mesh topology where we are allowed to cut cells and split them. And uh, if, if we do this, then these fields that we have, like the pressure, right? Uh, they will not map to the mesh anymore. So we will have um, uh, not, I mean, we will have uh, more cells than we have uh, pressure values. Uh, also, if we stretch the mesh somehow, if we compress uh, it or stretch it, then uh, the, the face centered uh, volumetric fluxes will change their magnitudes. And again, observer uh, subject, each time that the mesh is updated, the fields are updated. Uh, so the F mesh is a subject and the geometric fields are the observers. Yeah, enough with the <laughs> enough with the observer. So um, best practice here is uh, um, uh, to use this uh, whenever there's the same uh, member function like write, map, execute, read, update um, uh, that needs to be called for many objects. Um, and uh, obviously, it, it is uh, quite quite powerful. Um, finally, um, yeah, interrupt me at any point if there are any any questions. Um, I guess. You're fine. Okay. Um, no. So. I, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there, there is one question. Actually, two. Are the design patterns shown here today applicable in both .org and .com versions of OpenFOAM? Oh uh, yeah. So these are these are things. I mean, the object registry, the FB mesh, and the geometric field um, is uh, they are as old as as uh, OpenFOAM. So function objects uh, are also quite. I don't think they're not that, that old, but they are using the same patterns and they are there in both versions. So yeah, I, yes, definitely yes. So um, another question here, let's see. Uh, how large is the runtime run hit caused by the, uh, by the dynamic binding? Ah, uh, this is so nice question. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, these algorithms, um, it, it's practically zero. And, and, and why it's zero? Um, because the, uh, the, 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 the dynamic binding is done for something that loops over hundreds of thousands of cells per CPU core and does something. So compared to the 
to these cells. So, 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 so compared to uh, dynamic bounding, binding, this, this actual uh, calculation that is being done is huge. So um, that's another point for, for um, you know, when we're talking about generic or object-oriented programming, um, uh, using these uh, 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 techniques from object-oriented programming, um, uh, you will not introduce any overhead, at least not in a computational fluid dynamics uh, context. Okay, and um, this is uh, another thing that's important. You do not want to have uh, dynamic binding and strategies uh, selecting what you want to do um, on a point or a cell level. So the selection here is done um, for the whole mesh, for the whole field. So calculate the curvature from a sign distance field. That needs to be selected at, at runtime, right? This is where you want to do a dynamic polymorphism. Um, where you have a large hit in performance is uh, if you say, uh, well, um, I would like to dynamically select what I'm going to do to this vertex 16 that you see on the slide. Because if you do this, and if you do this, um, if, and if you select a different algorithm for different vertex, right? If statistically, if you're doing a lot of different uh, algorithm selection, this is something that's going to hit a uh, uh, heart in terms of, of, of uh, HPC resources. So, so you have to consider, so uh, this runtime selection stuff and, and uh, observer and all this, this all has to be done on a very, very, um, uh, on the level of the partial differential equation solution, not on the level of a single phase or, or a cell corner point. Then it doesn't hurt. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so let's let's look at uh, how this is basically enabled. I mean, everything that we talked to talked to, uh, about so far is possible, yeah, um, uh, uh, for, but, but you need to have this, this engine uh, that's creating these objects uh, based on user-defined input. Um, and this is uh, the runtime type selection uh, uh, in, in open form. It's a creational pattern that makes it possible to select uh, what types based on what we write in uh, configuration files. Uh, and if you look at the CFD, uh, uh, let's say solution algorithm, so we start with some mesh initialization, then we um, uh, initialize the fields. Again, we go into the CFD loop. And if you look on the right, we, when we initialize the mesh, so when you start your application, you have a fine, you have a binary code that you run, <laughs> click on a button. And when you do this, uh, the uh, uh, RTS uh, mechanism is going to select the dynamic mesh type. So it's going to select for you um, uh, either the motion of the mesh in terms of rotation or some deformation, refinement, uh, uh, addition or removal of layers. Uh, it's going to select solvers and preconditioners and, and things like this. The same goes for boundary conditions when the field, fields are initialized. And um, um, uh, when we uh, solve these uh, couple PDEs, um, uh, we will select the discretization and interpolation schemes. So this is at the core of open forms modularity is this runtime type selection. And it's really, it's, I find it amazing. It's really, 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 really cool. Um, okay, so um, uh, why is it nice? Because we don't have to touch the solver um, or our existing library. It's not always just about the solver. So we don't touch existing libraries in open form uh, if we want to select different boundary conditions, mesh handling, discretization schemes, and, and models. Um, and uh, how does this um, work in terms of, of, of research? Um, uh, this ease of use uh, simplifies research a lot because uh, you can uh, construct uh, the PDE discretization and solution using configuration files. And I'm just going to go through this, this point. Uh, we are not going to go into the detail about this, this, this um, pattern. It's, it's not easy. So there's no time in this context. So what, what we have is kind of like a class static hash table that maps user, like a human understandable strings, names of types. And it, it maps them to pointers to virtual member functions. And this thing is initialized for the base class and in the, its compilation unit. And it can be extended with help of some other classes, right? Um, in uh, uh, the compilation units of, of, the, of these derived classes. So every time that you define your user-defined type, you say, hey, I want to add this type to the runtime selection in the root here of the hierarchy. And you extend the hierarchy, right? And you can do this uh, uh, at compilation of your library without modifying existing legacy code, which is really great. 
And um, the problem is it's quite complicated. It's uh, the me mechanism itself is using a lot of pre-processing macro macros. I've linked it. Uh, uh, you will, if you download the PDF, you, you, you can investigate. Um, and uh, there's a short uh, uh, best practice for this. If your research software provides a creation uh, cat uh, pattern, use it. Um, uh, because um, it it's, uh, simplifies uh, testing a lot. Testing is super important and it, it saves time in research. And it's much better than if you if you hack your own if then else's uh, for, for different types of models that you're going to use because it works at the beginning and it will hurt you in the end. This is why we are not going to go into this, <laughs> into this pattern. I did it once and it, it changed me. <laughs> so we are going to skip it for today. Okay, um, so uh, we, we covered like all these, these uh, relevant um, patterns uh, um, and we are not going to go into these, these, uh, these uh, other two. Uh, I, I have placed them in the additional slides. You can download the PDF and look at them. Um, um, and we didn't cover generic programming um, which, because there's not, not enough time. But um, uh, if you know something about it, um, when you look at the code to the left, right? It looks like an equation. It's uh, actually a partial differential equation. And um, it, it works with all these mechanisms that I just mentioned. So we can write partial differential equations that look, they are humanly understandable. So they're not nested for loops in four loops in four loops. They are understandable. Um, uh, and, and we can do this and select all these schemes and everything at runtime because we are combining these uh, design patterns. And in this case, we are combining type lifting for geometric fields and differential operators. Then we have some generic traits for those of you that know uh, some, some generic programming for propagating tensor ranks. And when you're calculating gradients and divergence, you need, you need this as a, to define the return type. Then we use the template method that I just talked about and this runtime type selection that we just mentioned uh, for the discretization and interpolation schemes, then the strategy, right, that we also mentioned with runtime selection for linear solvers. And what you end up with is a domain specific language. It's like a language for discretizing partial differential equations, um, which is quite amazing. Okay, to, to, so to conclude, um, um, design patterns are not just, I mean, people are not using this just because it's there. Um, um, they, they actually can speed up research um, if there is a high degree of methodological uncertainty. So where you don't know which algorithms will work or in which combination, which as I say, in my case is 99% of the time, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, of course, one needs to avoid dogmatism. So not every design question has to be answered by a pattern. Some things are procedural, some things sometimes you have to break encapsulation, um, however horrible this sounds. Um, um, and when dealing with, with uh, legacy research codes, uh, it really helps to understand these design patterns and principles. Um, there's something called like a Carlo code programming. It's a very bad name for, 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 for just copy pasting things and then figuring out uh, how, what to do uh, by, by, by copy pasting, but it can really it can tank research projects in the long, long run. And I would, I would advise against it. Okay, so uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much and I hope we have some time uh, for some questions and discussion. Yes, thank you, uh, Thomas Lab. We do have some, uh, time for questions. And what I would like to do now, uh, speakers can unmute themselves. So I'd like to invite the participants, not speakers, the participants rather, can unmute themselves and ask questions directly to Thomas Lab. Questions for Tomislav? Yeah, feel free to unmute. Yes, I have one question. Yes, uh, please, Richard. Experience in um, reverse engineering legacy procedural uh, code into the uh, design patterns that you're referring to. Uh, just, just to, to make sure. So, what is my experience in like refactoring procedural codes uh, into into these kinds of design patterns? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I mean, the, the experience that I had so far, uh, we have had uh, some parts uh, of, of of open form that were quite, let's say, suboptimal, <laughs> um, uh, where we. Uh, had to extract uh, things from very large uh, member functions, separate them into smaller functions and make sure that something like this works. 
but um, my, I, I haven't been working with a lot of legacy code that's purely procedural, where I just have a large chunk of code. So uh, the, the maximum that I did so far was uh, take a, a member function that has, uh, takes, I don't know, 18 arguments and is uh, 5,000 line long and cleaning that up, that, that would be the maximum of, of refactoring I did. Any other questions for um, Tomislav? Uh, maybe one additional question. Um, uh, somewhat along the same lines. So if you want to start developing software with patterns, you've uh, indicated that basically you end up defining a domain specific language. So how much effort do you need to put into the design to make sure that you got the language right so that you can actually say what you need to say in your field and don't get stuck somewhere down the line having painted yourself into a corner where you can't actually express the things that you need to be able to do um well uh, i mean I, I did a lot of mistakes myself uh when when working on these on these research codes and the most i mean the gr greatest mistake that i did so far was not to keep things simple so um, I, was, I was thinking in terms of uh, uh, abstractions and in terms of making things uh, as general as possible and applicable to, to, to different domains. And if, if one does this, then um, the complexity of the code can explode super fast. And still there's no guarantee that this uh, domain specific language is going to work. In my case, it was a, a small C++ library that's uh, supposed to do geometrical intersections um, in 3D in a way that these intersections are robust and don't explode. And I ended up using uh, template metaprogramming. Uh, I actually like ended up using um, some, some, some really nice um, uh, tag uh, uh, dispatching system there. Um, and I really loved it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> in trying to keep these things generic, what happened is I went more and more and more away um, uh, from the actual application goal. And uh, I found out after two and a half years um, of doing this, that in order to make this work um, uh, uh, and work efficiently, uh, I have to sac sacrifice these abstractions. So uh, depending on uh, the field of research that you're in, um, I, I would come back to the beginning and say, keep things as simple as possible um, uh, in order to get modularity, uh, because modularity is the key. Uh, 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 at least in, in, it's the key to research. So you want to be able to be flexible in um, what you are choosing to do on the computer. Uh, and uh, this flexibility shouldn't harm uh, computational efficiency. So, so I don't know if, if this uh, uh, helps. It's, it's a very, very um, difficult question, uh, but um, I would start super simple and then um, ramp up. And um, only, only when I see, I mean, one example would be, um, another example would be basically, yeah, uh, well, um, basically we could, uh, there's, a, there's a project now in, in open form to connect it to Petsy, which is a linear algebra um, um, a library, a huge project um, uh, for, for linear algebra. So uh, if, if you would want to do this natively inside open form, um, uh, um, it would be necessary to change uh, the return type of all uh, discretization schemes. There are 80 discretization schemes in open form. So there are like 80 different classes uh, whose member functions would need to be changed in order to add this new return type uh, because the C++ language doesn't distinguish these, these member functions or functions in general based on the return type. So a pragmatic way of working would say, let's take the existing engine and translate these, this matrix format into a format that Petsy understands and then figure out where we are and then uh, uh, um, maybe come back to this kind of redesign. So um, don't, I mean, the, the, the bad idea is to start thinking in terms of the optimal design from the start. That's, that's going to lead to a lot of complications. So long, long answer, but it's a complex question. Right. Okay, thanks. Tomislav, there is another question here. Um, from your experience, what would be good practices for designing class interfaces that survive for several years without you needing to update them often uh, to cover more cases? 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's another, <laughs> I mean, if, I would say uh, it's, it's very difficult to do that. Um, and uh, I think that, I mean, source code grows with time. So of course, we would like to program something uh, that is, uh, so to say, sustainable and uh, that, we're, that doesn't have a lot of design flaws and we don't have to modify it a lot. Uh, but uh, in my humble experience as with like my mechanical engineering and applied math background and not a software architect or by, 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 by trade, so to say, um, uh, it's, it's really hard to do that. I mean, um, it can lead to something called a design freeze where, where you're trying to uh, create this perfect design of the, of the system that, that, that you're building um, and, and it end up, ends up changing anyway. So um, uh, in, in terms of re when you're talking about research software, um, what needs to stay as a goal is uh, getting simulation results. So getting, getting results, uh, research results. Uh, this should be uh, paramount. And then uh, if uh, these design patterns can help do this and help make uh, the research software sustainable, um, then of course they should be applied. But I think, I don't know, I mean, in my personal opinion, I'm not sure it's, it's really possible to, to uh, uh, write these interfaces in a way that they stay unchanged with time. Uh, it's, it's very, very hard. I, I wasn't, maybe it's just me. I wasn't able to do that. We, we change our code, so we have to, yeah. Okay, Tom's lab, I think, thank you very much. I think that was a nice uh, webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. Our next webinar is going to be on April 13th. I have already pasted the uh, some information there in the chat. So thank you all for again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.